Do we have too much government? We need to put uh, people in ahead of corporate profits. This system is so lopsided, this threat is a real threat to democracy. And I think that's really important. That's something we haven't been doing in this country for a long time. Where do you start? What do you do? How do you do it? Access to Democracy and other Egan Community Television programming is supported by Thomson Reuters, makers of Westlaw Next and based in Egan. Through Westlaw Next and other innovative online services, Thomson Reuters is the world's leading source of intelligent information for businesses and professionals. Online at ThomsonReuters.com and by U.S. Federal Credit Union, the member-owned financial institution offering service, value, and experience you can trust to the greater Twin Cities community. Welcome. It's Access to Democracy, and I am particularly pleased and honored with the show that we have for you today. As far as I know, it's a first. We have three members of the Minnesota Supreme Court with us today to really share with you some of their experiences and some information about the judiciary. And I'm going to start on the far end because uh, a favorite guest of ours who's been here probably 30 times is Paul Anderson who unbelievably has reached the mandatory retirement age of the court and uh, with just an incredible legal career will be stepping down in May. So Justice Anderson, welcome back. I'm pleased to be here, but I, I just thought if you'd gotten one more justice, we could actually have done some business here on your show this afternoon. You got four, you know, we had a, I, I had had only have a plurality, so. I had had that d the discussion and somebody mentioned earlier the open meetings law uh, <laughs> would preclude us from doing that. <laughs> Justi De Justice David Strauss has been on the court since 2010 uh, with a, a very interesting career. Uh, we got him uh, away from Kansas and uh, he taught at the university law school for uh, six years if I'm not mistaken and was named to the court by uh, Governor Pawlenty in 2010. And until recently, he was the junior member of the court. But now we have a new junior member of the court, Justice Wilhelmina Wright. And welcome for the first time on Access. Thank you. What I hope will be the first of many times. Thank you. And uh, also with an incredible background. Uh, started Yale, Harvard. Uh, you were a prosecutor. You were a trial judge. You are a judge in the Court of Appeals, and now you are the junior justice, at least for a short period of time, on the Minnesota Supreme Court. That is and, correct. Uh, why don't you give us a little bit more of your background, because the other judges have been with us previously. Well, I arrived in Minnesota in 1995 uh, as a result of a professional opportunity to join the United States Attorney's Office. Um, there I prosecuted violent crimes and uh, complex frauds uh, that were occurring throughout the state of Minnesota. It was a wonderful training ground and opportunity to serve uh, the citizens of Minnesota and for me to get to know my new uh, beloved home state. Um, I grew up in Virginia and um, and went from Virginia to Yale undergraduate school and then Harvard Law School. I clerked for a judge, Judge Damon Keith, on the United States Court of Appeals. His chambers are in Detroit, Michigan, and so served there uh, for two years and then went to Hogan and Hartson and practiced um, in private practice in Washington, D.C. for that so law firm. So you really run the gamut. You've been in practice, you've been a prosecutor, you've been in the courts, uh, and here you are now. How are you finding the Minnesota Supreme Court? I love my work. I feel very, very fortunate to have been given the opportunity to serve in this capacity. 
every day I am challenged in a wonderful way um, to look at the law carefully, render good, fair decisions, and then to explain the work th of the court in our decisions, in our opinions. Um, I have wonderful colleagues. You've had the opportunity to write a few now. I have. Um, I've been on the bench, on the Supreme Court bench, since October and um, have heard um, several oral arguments at this point, and everyone is engaging and challenging. It's interesting because uh, the only native Minnesotan here is Justice Anderson. Uh, I was a transplant from New York, uh, you from Virginia, uh, uh, Justice Strauss came from Kansas, and uh, you've been here before, but uh, and you've been here, uh, certainly we've discussed some of the uh, rigors of the court and some of the really joys of the court. Uh, does that still hold true? It absolutely does hold true. I would echo uh, what Justice Wright mentioned, which is um, I feel very fortunate as well to be on the court. And um, though the work can be difficult, it can be challenging, um, sometimes it can even be mind bending. Um, it's just, I enjoy it every day. The challenge is there, um, and, and it's, really an en it's, it's really enjoyable to go into work and, and know that you're making a difference uh, in the lives of people uh, and in the, in the legal community and, the, and, and to the law at large. Um, it's, it's a wonderful job. Now, Justice Anderson, uh, on Tuesday and Wednesday, I believe, was judging moot court competition uh, in the Supreme Court. As a matter of fact, I was privileged to sit in on that and uh, <coughs> actually be in the bench uh, in one of your seats, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> at the end of that, Thomson Reuters presented you with nine volumes of opinions that you have written in the court. Yes, that, that was a stunning thing. I mean, it was very surprising. Uh, almost a foot and a half of shelf space for the books that have my opinions, and there's going to be one more, I understand, that take it up through the end of uh, May. And uh, actually, knowing that I was going to be on the court with my colleagues today, I, I looked at those opinions and thinking about, you know, I, said, I, I looked at the space and I said, I wonder how you folks are going to be filling in. You know, what's, I mean, because I, I looked at those opinions and they're all my little darlings. I remember things and they're all, you know, it, and you've got all of that in front of you yet. I mean, you probably each, well, you've probably got a volume and a half and uh, Justice Wright, you're starting on the first part of your volume. I think that's right. And uh, it's, uh, it's, I, mean, I, I thought about it today I'm envious a little bit about you, uh, your future and what's going to hold, but then you were down there Sunday with me. I'm, I'm not going to miss those Sundays <laughs> and Sunday evenings working because it's a tough job. Would you both agree? It absolutely is a tough job. It's and not a nine to five, that's for sure. No. People have to understand that. And the citizens of Minnesota deserve <clears throat> that hard work, frankly, on our yeah. part. Yeah, and as, as it happens, I was actually in the office briefly on, uh, on Sunday. Well, when I, 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 I share a clerk with Justice Strauss, and I'm, it's a tug. It, it's, it's, I mean, he is, uh, he, he, he's, he's demanding because he's got so much that's, that's going on. So, I mean, the bottom line here is that uh, as I'm leaving is that uh, I take um, a lot of comfort in the fact that I know that uh, the two uh, junior colleagues are work as hard and care so much about the court because you, you know, when you've been on the court for a while, you really get invested and you, you care for it a lot and it's going to be in good hands. I'm, I'm fine. And incredibly, I mean, you've had 20 years going into the 20th year on the Supreme Court. That, that is pretty unique in and of itself. Well, I think most, uh, Barry Anderson and I are talking, the average is about 10 or eight, maybe nine years. I mean, it's, uh, so yes, I've been long. I am not the longest serving member on our current court. I understand I that. am the 10th longest serving member in history and the ninth longest serving member in history is still on the court. That's my colleague, Alan Page. I'll ask all of you, in the last 20 years, how has the practice of law and the bench changed in your experience? And maybe I'll ask Justice Strauss first. You know, uh, in my background, I've had a lot of 
a variety of experiences from from being a law professor to to, to practicing in Washington DC and one of the things that I'm noticing is um, I, I think that law schools and the law profession are going through fundamental shifts right now um, you know clients aren't willing to pay uh, the large fees um, and to essentially train first and second and third year attorneys um, and to pay for that um, and so I think you're seeing a lot of consolidation um, in the legal field I think you're seeing uh, large and small law firms struggling a bit more. You're seeing a massive decline uh, in the number of people registering and taking the LSAT and then going on to law school. Um, I was talking to some deans of some law schools just the other day, and, and most of the law schools are down in terms of applications, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. And so I think we are seeing a significant sort of restructuring of the legal profession in a way that, frankly, I don't know that we've seen in the last 50 years. Um, so it's going to be interesting going forward to see how the practice of law changes. Technology has obviously had a huge influence on, on how we practice law. and So I think we're seeing some changes. And we don't know if that's good or bad. That's down the road of history to determine. Right. Justice Wright, what about you? Well, I see it also in the area of legal education and the changes that are, are taking place there. Um, in my generation and uh, years before that, many times when a student got to the end of their college education and they weren't quite sure what to do, it was a safe bet to go to law school. You knew you were going to be trained well and that you would have a set of skills that would be valuable even if you chose not to practice. I think now there's much more consideration by law students or prospective law students on the front end of the proposition. They are being discriminating customers and making sure that the legal education that they will be purchasing with um, heavy tuition um, debt or load and many times debt uh, is one that they think is right for them. And I think frankly that is a good um, prospect for the law and for the law schools because we do need to make sure that law schools are training individuals to uh, use their degrees and to uh, practice or to put those degrees to work in public service. And so I think that uh, the right sizing that is resulting from law schools turning to clinical programs where actual practical knowledge and experience is as important as the theory and the doctrine of the law. I think that's a good change. Well, It'll when, take some adjustment. When I announced to my family that I wanted to go to law school, uh, my mother's reaction was, but all your cousins are doctors. <laughs> 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 and I said, well, that tells you something about what I think of my cousins. Uh, <laughs> I, I think I, I echo everything my colleagues have said, and I'm going to focus a little differently on what I see coming to our court. Uh, the, the type of case that we're getting at the the court has changed over the 20 years. We're getting many fewer civil cases. Uh, we uh, Special term is when we go over the cases that we're going to decide whether we take or don't take. I've gone through a number of uh, special terms lately when almost all the cases were criminal. I think that's a result of uh, a couple of factors, but one of the main factors I think is arbitration and alternative dispute res uh, resolution which in many ways is a good thing. Some ways I'm concerned about it because in some ways it, uh, you run into some contracts of adhesion that take away the right to a jury trial. But also uh, it will change how the law develops because we are a court of last resort. We are a policy determining court. Uh, so often at oral argument we ask, well, counsel, we know you want to win, but what is the rule of law that you want us to articulate? And that's a very important function, and uh, I would be interested, David, and uh, maybe if you agree, is that you see that we maybe aren't getting as many civil cases as we'd like. Well, I actually agree 100%, and I, and I think the underlying reason that Justice Anderson identifies is exactly right. A lot of this, quite frankly, is being driven by the United States Supreme Court and by Congress, uh, the Federal Arbitration Act. Um, part of it's private, it's cheaper and more expeditious to do, um, you know, to do arbitration or alternative dispute resolution. But at the same time, the Supreme Court, uh, going back the last five or six years, 
uh, has been given uh, uh, a lot of effect to these arbitration agreements. You see this, there's several cases they've decided, a case called Stolt-Nielsen, um, AT&T versus Concepcion, a number of cases they've decided um, have really elevated arbitration and alternative dispute resolution um, in a way that I think we haven't seen before. And so I actually think that, that the trend that, that Justice Anderson identifies is going to continue over the next five to ten years of, of seeing fewer civil cases. This is right. And what's, what's interesting, <coughs> I agree with my colleagues, and what's interesting about that concept is being uh, a justice of the Supreme Court, a judge of the Minnesota Court of Appeals, as I was before, we look to those cases being brought to us in order to develop the law, in order to articulate what the law is, as in, and then it, uh, give to practitioners as well as to businesses and consumers an understanding of what their rights are. Without those cases coming to us and with the advent of arbitration and private uh, decision making with regard to those rights, there's less um, predictability, uh, less opportunity to really understand what the law is because the courts aren't developing it as much. So we are quite a passive institution in terms of the nature of the cases that come to us. We don't go out and grab them, uh, so to speak. We have to still wait for the case and controversy to are of formulate throughout the court system. And so if they aren't entering through the courthouse door, the courts won't be developing that law. Uh, I've also thought over the last few years that because our society is changing and because uh, there have been so many different approaches toward the Bill of Rights, for instance, that more cases are gravitating up to the higher courts. Uh, for instance, 20 years ago, we, we wouldn't think about a drone case and whether a drone is intruding on Fourth Amendment rights by flying over a marijuana field or by your, over your own property. And today, that's something that's a consideration, not just drones that are involved in warfare, but drones that are being used in industry and everything else. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, I'd like to get David's comment on that because, well, both the two of them because they've been in the federal courts. But uh, one of the things is uh, lawyers are getting more imaginative on some of mm -hmm. these cases. And you've uh, seen it, I think, maybe in the uh, federal court system. No, that's right. Um, I will say this, which is I anticipated um, seeing the types of cases uh, that you mentioned, Alan. I anticipated seeing the Facebook and the Twitter and the, the drone cases and things like that. I thought we'd see some of that, and we have seen some of it, but not nearly as much as I would have thought we would have seen. I mean, technology, is, I don't think, is driving our docket in the same way that one might anticipate. That may not be true and probably well, isn't maybe true. Maybe it hasn't caught up with you yet. Or maybe it hasn't caught up, but that's not true for the United <coughs> States Supreme Court. I mean, last term they had a GPS case uh, where somebody attached a GPS device to uh, a Jeep Cherokee, the Jones case. Um, they're seeing a lot of those types of cases. So for whatever reason, it hasn't hasn't filtered down or, or filtered over to the state court system quite as much. But I do think it is um, such an, an, an interesting way to look at exactly how our courts work, whether state or federal. It is the development of technology. It is the development of our understanding of our relationships with one another that can then bring about a controversy or a case that then needs to be decided in the courts. So I remember a big case was whether or not um, the, the police could detect the amount of heat that was coming from a basement um, to determine whether or not there was reasonable articulable suspicion to uh, search a, um, a, a home because there was an expectation that there might be marijuana plants growing. So the law really does respond to what's going on in our society, in our community, um, but only if those cases are brought to us. And in some respects, we uh, have to be patient um, and wait for those cases to develop and then be prepared to um, analyze the law and look at how it may apply to very new and different situations. We, we had an example just this week uh, with the, uh, or last week, I guess, the Boston Marathon bombing. And what we saw a lot in the papers was the public safety exception to the Miranda rule. And is there a public safety 
exception to the Miranda rule. Uh, Thirty years ago, it was pretty hard and fast. You were arrested, you were given your Miranda rights. Now, uh, if there's an imminent threat to society, it seems you can suspend the uh, Miranda rights, and the question is for how long? And I know that's going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. And it may find its way into our courts as well, so I think I'm going to let my colleagues, mm -hmm. if they choose to d discuss that, to do so. But that's it's certainly a, not something that, as a justice who expects to um, be sitting on cases that may very well raise those very issues, um, that I can speak to now. Well, I'll give you my reaction on what I heard it being discussed, is that uh, it will be decided, as Justice Wright says. It, we, uh, our court might have to face this. I won't be there. And so it uh, behooves us not to address it or speculate. But my reaction was, ooh, be careful what you're doing here, you know, is that uh, if you are making some assumption as to what the law is, uh, you need to be careful if you assume there's an exception because uh, uh, I'm not sure that the court has ruled definitively on that issue yet. I will say what is helpful about discussions like that is it brings to the people the very you know, real <laughs> life situations in which the law has to be grappled with and where the law may in fact be changing or may need to be articulated more clearly. So, um, in speaking to um, my teenage daughter, suddenly a conversation around the dinner table was about Miranda. Miranda versus Arizona, which gave rise to the Miranda rights. And so to the extent we have current events in a discourse or an issue that is brought forward that really energizes the public and makes the public curious about what the law is and how it might be developing, I think that is a, a very useful service that the public, the press, the media are, are bringing forward because it does help educate our citizens. Well, and one thing that I would, I would highlight, which I think Justice Wright's um, initial response uh, sort of talked about, was the fact that we aren't like the other branches of government. We're not the legislative branch. We're not the executive branch. We don't go out and sort of develop or create issues in the way that the other branches of government do. We're, we're much more passive, and we need cases and controversies brought to us before we can act. Um, and so, you know, um, these issues like the Miranda warnings and things like that, those issues, when I, bec when I start thinking about them, is when we get a case brought to us. I mean, I do think about them, I still read about things like that, but I don't, I don't really spend a lot of my time thinking about what case may, be, may come before us, because quite frankly, I'm busy enough with the cases that have actually come before us um, and how difficult they are. Well, um, yeah, and that, that sets us yeah. apart. And we don't know how they're going to come right. before us. We don't know how they're going to be framed. And so, I mean, we don't want to speculate as to an answer because we don't know the framing. And it could be a brought to us broadly, could be on a very narrow point of view, and it doesn't do the institution any mm -hmm. good to speculate on that. I think <coughs> one of the things that's very unfair is that judges get categorized. Uh, for instance, you started out uh, being known, uh, Justice Anderson, as a Republican justice, and you probably have become one of the more liberal members of the court. And uh, when Justice Strauss was nominated, people said, oh, he clerked for Thomas. He's going to be uh, to the right. Now, I just read a decision of yours where you reversed a murder conviction uh, a few months ago. Uh, in a, I think it was a 4-3 decision Might have been. In, in which you wrote the opinion uh, in a first-degree murder case. So I, I don't think you can categorize a judge like well, that. I, well think I can. I categorize him completely. I call him principled. Well, that's a good category. Yeah. I mean, no, I do. I mean, is <coughs> it? I mean, uh, I mean, we disagree, but uh, I, I and I'm very serious about this. And David, you know that is that we, you know, as they say, is that to figure out where David's going, I'm going to be looking to his fundamental principles as to how he views the law. They're not political. They're oriented by That's a philosophy of the law. That's what people have to understand is that they are not political. That they are, yes, you are individuals, and yes, you have certainly opinions about life and things like that. But as you view the law, and I know, for instance, what a student of the law you are and have been. Uh, you're in that emerging area, 
right now, um, but your background speaks well to that. So that you're not always going to be on the same side of a particular philosophical case. It's how you view the law and what the law says to you. Well, I think actually that's a great attribute of any multi-member court, uh, particularly one like ours where we have seven justices. I really enjoy, quite frankly, the debates I have with my colleagues like Justice Anderson and Justice Wright. I like the airing of ideas uh, in concurrences and dissents and majority opinions. I think that what that does is it sharpens the analysis of the court. It makes people understand the weaknesses of their own positions. Uh, it makes people understand the implications of the decisions we're making. I think it's a very healthy part of what we do. I'm not sure everyone thinks that way, but I, that's certainly well, my point. I, I want to interject because I want to sure. hear what my news colleague <laughs> says about this. I mean, you've, you've been uh, a trial judge all by yourself, Court of Appeals three. Now you sit around the table with seven of us. I mean, I find that I, experience uh, so, uh, so stimulating and interesting. But what's it like? I mean, from the new perspective, what's it like sitting around and having us talk about a case? Well, it is a very, very rich decision-making process that we engage in when you get seven judges sitting around a table. We've all read the material. We've all had, in most cases, an oral argument where we've been able to test our ideas about the case, about our view of the law, hear from the parties who know the case so well, uh, the, their lawyers explaining their positions. And then we sit and very respectfully discuss our views about the case. And it's not, I like this, I like that. These are legal decisions that we are rendering and so we are relying on the case law we're relying on the doctrine we are applying the law to the facts in the case and um, I have been the only judge in the courtroom having to make a decision and found that to be a very uh, challenging and rewarding type of work um, I have sat with just three judges and I say just three now it seemed like a lot of judges when I was coming from the trial court but with three judges um, deciding a case and I find now with seven of us it is a very rich discussion and it's very dynamic as dynamic as each of the individuals bringing their ideas and their view of the law and um, it is as Justice Strauss said it is one in which we are uh, working together to get to a legal decision and the the beauty of it I think is the full engagement of everyone in expressing their views in testing an idea in uh, responding to each other's ideas and um, what is even better about that is the manner in which we do it uh, whether we all agree which is sometimes happens, but many times we don't. It is done in an orderly, in a respect, respectful manner, in a way that's designed to create the best decision of the court and the best opinions, and many times there is more than one that's written on a case, um, created by our, our various justices on the court. And so it's a collaborative process where each of us really plays a major role. And um, I think it is um, the case that I I there aren't lots of opportunities for individuals to be so utterly engaged in, in an idea, in a, in a view of the law, in a case, um, and develop it with their colleagues um, and really benefit from that discussion and uh, then go off to their chambers and get to work on writing that decision. Justice Anderson, uh, over the 20 years, have you found uh, that in a lot of cases, I won't even say a lot of cases, you came in to the conference with one opinion and you left after hearing the arguments of the other judges with another opinion or vice versa? Oh yeah, it happens uh, <coughs> with more frequency than you might anticipate it. Not that great a frequency to see that your whole thinking flips and you go in coming one way and come out thinking another, although that happens. What happens most is a refinement in the theory and the how the case gets decided and uh, statutory interpretation, how you look at the statute. I mean, I, I just recently had an experience on the court where 
during the discussion, I thought that the chief was coming from out in uh, left field. I just didn't. And then as the discussion developed around the table, said, you know, I now see exactly what point she's trying to make, and I think she's correct on it. Now, it, it didn't change the result, but it did change how we got to the result, and it refined it and sharpened it. Or is it, I just, okay, I'm going to be, there's an opinion that got released on Wednesday where I am the author on that opinion. And uh, Justice Strauss is signed on to the opinion. But that opinion started out looking quite a bit different than it did when it was finally released because he and I were, went back Which and forth. We must that? have gone, that's uh, Hawkinson. Hawkinson. We must have gone back six, seven times as far as, you know, refining and sharpening. And, and I read that before I released it and I thought, really, this is, this is a good opinion. It's going to be helpful. It's going to be clear. It's going to inform. It wouldn't have been that way if you and I hadn't have that dialogue. And that came out yesterday. Yeah. That involved forensic evidence. Mm -hmm. and good faith and destruction. Right. And it involved blood. Yep. Uh, whether uh, the Bureau of, what is it, Criminal? Uh, the Bureau of Criminal Apparatus, BCA. Right. Whether they should have destroyed blood samples after a period of time or not. Well, and it dealt with a, with a whole series of really difficult U.S. Supreme Court cases yeah. and doctrine that goes back about 30 years where you had to kind of put the puzzle together because the Supreme Court really hadn't given us the instruction to, to fit this particular situation. And there's a bifurcation in the approach with respect to, I won't get in detail, yeah. and, and that's where uh, Justice Strauss was so helpful to me. Is sort of, I, mean, I gotta be very keen. Justice Strauss is much more of a Fed than I am. I mean, he's got much more of a federal background. I would say that Justice Wright is somewhere in between. But it's a very valuable uh, perspective to come on court, especially the insight that you bring as to how the Supreme Court law develops and how it has developed. That's, that's been fun to see. And in that case, you just determined that they should not have destroyed the blood sample, if I'm not mistaken. No, we, uh, you know, is it, uh, it was not the type of evidence that was so material and relevant that we didn't go to the second issue of good faith and then the BCA had acted in a good faith manner and so we could use the results. It's not easy to keep up with all of your cases and I sp speak collectively. Is there a time when events transcend the law transcend the Constitution. Uh, for instance, during the Civil War, habeas corpus was suspended by uh, President Lincoln. Uh, are, are there times when it becomes imperative that something like that happens? We are not the branch to transcend uh, uh, the principle in those circumstances. Alexander Hamilton talked about the ill humors that can emanate from society themselves. And I think our branch is probably, and I'd like your response, the, the, the most important guardian that we don't lose perspective in times of crisis and that we adhere to the fundamental law which is in the Constitution. You know, I think there's there's a lot of merit to that, and I think that really the value of looking back at, say, the suspension of habeas corpus during the Civil War um, and other tumultuous periods in American history is future generations of lawyers and judges um, learn from those experiences in a way that, um, you know, that guides us in, in our decision making. Um, I don't know that I can answer the question directly, but I will say that um, you know, that it is helpful to look back at cases that, we, that our courts decided or cases that the U.S. Supreme Court ha has decided uh, that come from periods like that um, because I think they provide us some guidance. Interesting, historically, one of the strongest reprimands to Lincoln for suspending the writ of habeas corpus came from a chief justice of the Supreme Court in Wisconsin. Wisconsin had only been a state for a dozen years but very articulate in saying you can't do this. And of course, Lincoln ultimately backed off and went a different direction on that whole issue. So we have a, I mean, we feel it, don't we, that, that role? Mm -hmm. Now down to practical issues. Uh, budgets have been slashed. Uh, everything has been cut back 
in recent years, including the courts. How has uh, budget constraints affected how you're able to do your job? I, th I think personally having, you know, I haven't spent nearly as much time in, in, in the state court system as either of my colleagues uh, in total. Um, but what I think is, is as you start cutting budgets, you start cutting, and we hope this isn't true, but you start cutting the quality of justice. You, you, st you start cutting uh, the speed at which justice can be administ administered. And um, I, you know, we are, on the whole, the state judiciary is more thinly staffed, I think it's fair to say, than the federal judiciary. Um, and I think that, that can affect the quality of our work. I mean, and I was surprised to learn that there are, I think, seven or ten clerks for the judges in the court, that's rather correct. than ten. each judge having a clerk or two clerks. And uh, uh, I don't know what your experience was in the Court of Appeals, but I assume it was similar. It was. In the Court of Appeals, we had one and one-third law clerks. Um, and, and I compare that, that's when I was a judge in the Minnesota Court of Appeals, I compare that to my experience as a law clerk for my judge, Judge Damon Keith, back in the late 80s, early 90s, and there were three law clerks for one judge. And um, frankly, the volume has continued to grow, um, and yet we m many times are doing more with less. I also don't want to lose sight of what it means in the trial courts mm -hmm. when we have um, budget cuts that affect the speed of the ability to hear cases so there can be longer delays. You can have instances where um, you know, courts are going on for much longer periods of time because of crowded dockets, and so court may be lasting well into the evening just because in order to address a case, you can't, you know, treat it like a drive-through <laughs> order. Um, let me share a little observation with respect to both my colleagues. I think both were a little bit surprised how thinly staffed we were at the Supreme Court when you got to the highest court of the state and see how, you know, budget cuts and other resulted in it being thinly staffed with law clerks and assistants. Yeah, and let me say, you know, I don't worry so much that I'm going to have to work hard. I mean, it's not the fact that I that a lot of us work six or seven days a week. Um, it's the fact that uh, even I know working, that you work hard whether you have a clerk right, or not. Right, the uh, difference is, is what I worry about is that we don't have enough staff, and this is true of the trial courts too, that we start missing things um, or that we don't do the best job that we possibly can in admi administering justice. So it's really about doing doing right by the citizens of Minnesota and, and to carry out the constitutional duties that come with our office. It's not so much about, about the hard work that goes along with it. Well, and I also think delay is a concern. Um, people, ha these are important matters to Minnesotans and uh, that come before us and they would like to have their cases resolved in a timely fashion and to the extent it takes longer to do that, um, that is, is something we are all concerned about. The New York Times just had a series on the criminal courts in the Bronx and it was mind-boggling uh, that people who being held one case and can't get to trial court for one reason or another. One man was held for four years uh, and was still awaiting trial because it was a capital case and they couldn't make bail. Uh, that to me is beyond unconscionable and, uh, and yet uh, there's just a question of overwork and staffing and how, how can you deal with that? I worry about public defenders because I think that they don't have nearly uh, the equipment or the help at their fingertips that prosecutors have. And how does that affect justice? I, I think it affects it very adversely. Well, I'm going to address that in how I respond when foreign visitors come from other countries and they want the rule of law and they want a good judicial system. I say, you need a good public defender system. Uh, when I know that there's been a good public defender available or the system has worked, it makes my job <coughs> easier because the issues get sorted out, they get uh, fleshed out, and the attorney will do that. Uh, what you don't like to see are mistakes, waiver, uh, things that get missed at the trial. Uh, well, and, and I'm going to go back to one of your earlier questions. I, I, I think how it's changed, I see 
uh, more routinely coming up uh, allegations on appeal that something went wrong with respect to the consul and how they were represented. And I think that's a factor of the public defenders being overworked. They, uh, they're, they're limited in the time that they can interact with their clients. And, and I think and you put your finger on it right. I, I agree, and I want to make sure that we, we leave the right impression, which is that the public defenders that serve the state of Minnesota are hardworking, they're very smart, they're very conscientious, and they're working hard on behalf of their clients. And it is that shortage of resources that can make it hard for them to see the number of clients that they need to see in one day to provide them with the counsel. And so that is um, what we're talking about here uh, in terms of making sure that they have the resources and the staffing so that we can have a fair system of justice. Which that's is what all we want. what we want. I yes. mean, that's the ideal. Yes. Whether we live up to that. Now, you just authored a, an interesting case which was uh, whether it was within the province of the jury to uh, decide about a medical expert and a forensics expert people against Zong, was it? Uh, that is correct. Um, that was a first-degree murder case that went to trial, and um, there was a question as to the nature of the expert uh, uh, testimony that was provided by a medical examiner and a firearms examiner. Um, the, it was a uh, murder case that occurred um, in the metro um, a theft of a car and, and a shooting that resulted from was that. Was that a drive-by shooting, if I'm not mistaken? No, it was not a drive-by oh, shooting. It, it was a first-degree murder, meaning it, it was premeditated. And uh, what the facts uh, were determined to be based on the jury's verdict um, was that an individual, um, calcul in a calculating way, decided that he wanted to steal a car based on and, and that he had seen advertised on Craigslist lured um, the owner of the car who was selling it to a location uh, during a test drive, feigned um, that the driver feigned that he, during the test drive feigned that he needed to relieve himself or no, needed to actually, uh, he heard something wrong with the car, needed to get out and check it out. They got out of the car and it was at that point um, that the individual who was doing the test driving of the car uh, with the owner shoots the owner and then uh, leaves. And so the question was whether the shooting was accidental. And so there was a forensic examiner who looked at um, the gun that was used and determined whether or not it could have gone off accidentally. And um, the other was th the um, forensic examiner, another forensic examiner who uh, was commenting on the various types of homicide and whether or not that testimony indicated uh, improperly a particular intent which is uh, necessary for a first degree murder. And so that was the, those were the issues. The opinion I hope is clearly written so that any Minnesotan can read it and understand the decision. I think it was unanimous reasoning. as a matter of fact. But Alan, that was. touches on a point we talked about before is that we have a job as a court to scrutinize forensic science as it's used in the courtroom because it's such powerful evidence. And so uh, we have a level of uh, you know, scrutiny we have to apply. And we, and this is the thing we do, hey, we have to develop a level of expertise that sometimes we never thought we had to. Right, right. Each, each you know, uh, Justice Anderson has, has joked in some ways, uh, but there's truth to it, which is that every time you take on a case and you write an opinion, you become the world's expert on that particular issue for two or three weeks. And, and you so get you cases, develop that for expertise. instance, on a patent, perhaps, or, well, or something actually, like that? Well, actually, the federal courts do a lot more of the patent type work, but we do get well, scientific matters. Scientific yeah. matters. We get very complicated corporate matters and, and, and wills and trusts matters. Um, I mean, trade we, secrets. Trade secrets. I mean, yes, we, we get a lot of stuff where going in, you may not be an expert, but, but writing the opinion, you better be an expert by the and end. And the wonderful yeah. thing about the work of a judge, and it's true at the trial court, it's true at the Supreme Court, is that we are the last 
I maintain, generalists in the law. We see that broad range of cases. Uh, many practitioners are specializing in that area um, that the case is about. And whereas we get such a broad range of cases, we are looking at so many different areas of the law. It's one of the reasons why I love what I do. And I think uh, going to that also, the fact that all three of you were not necessarily public servants all your life, but your backgrounds are such that you've had a broad background, helps you become a better judge. You perhaps clerked in a court, you worked in a firm, uh, but you have done things in the real world that I think have to help make you a better judge. And don't underestimate that there are seven of us who come from, each of us have a separate, mm -hmm. different background that, that really does enrich the process. And I think it's really important. It's a, uh, when you get a, uh, for instance, I know how it works, the U.S. Supreme Court gets dozens of petitions for certiorari and things like that and takes four judges to say yes whether a case is heard. How does it work in the Minnesota Supreme Court? It takes three. Right. Three. And this is important to, to understand and know. We, we start, we, we meet in special term twice a month, and every vote counts. And even if Justice Wright now is the last to speak, she will speak vociferously if she thinks we should take a case, even if there aren't enough votes by the time uh, it gets to her, because we can change. I mean, we, it, it's, a, it's an amazing process, is that the new justice is one-seventh, and uh, no more, no less, and uh, the value is there. And I remember, David, the first special term we had, uh, you know, you were, we went down and nobody had said take the case and you said we should and you changed the court we took the case well and actually it turned out to be a major case that ended up leading to two or three additional opinions over the course of two or three years um, but i think that's that is one of the amazing things and that's where the diversity of experience can help uh, for instance, you know, if, uh, Justice Barry Anderson, who's one of our colleagues, uh, was a municipal lawyer for years, and so he understands municipal law in a way that some of the some of the rest of us don't understand it. And so we're able to make make our case as to why why a certain case should be granted. And sometimes you succeed, sometimes you don't, sometimes your colleagues go along with you. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting about the way we do petitions for review is we discuss and vote on every single petition that comes before us, no matter what the issue is. Um, that is not necessarily true of other courts. It's not true of the United States Supreme Court, who gets about 10 times more petitions than we do. Um, to, to have a case discussed at the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, you have to have it placed on the discuss list. And so every single case that comes before us at least gets a, a minute or two of our time and we discuss it. And who decides who writes the decisions? It's random. It is. Uh, we uh, just basically the, ways, the way it works, and the colleagues of supplement is that we basically get somewhere around 12 to 14 cases for oral argument each month. Uh, we're, uh, we get them assigned in order, and so is that uh, at the beginning of the session in the uh, end of August, September, the first case goes to the chief, then it goes to Alan Pace, then it would go to me. And uh, it, we just, as the case comes up, it gets assigned to the justice. It's, it's random. The only exception being is that the uh, commissioner will look at first-degree murder cases and attorney discipline cases, which are both a little bit outside the uh, ordinary uh, first-degree murder because they can be really w uh, lengthy with sufficiency of the evidence. Make sure that one justice doesn't wind up with all first-degree murder cases during a year or too many. Uh, uh, but it's balanced, and then if the case is assigned to a particular justice, and after conference that justice gets three other votes, you're right. And that actually, the system is actually to the benefit in some ways of the junior most justices because on some courts, the chief justice assigns based on seniority, a lot of other courts. And so the Including junior justices. the U.S. Supreme Court. Right. And so the junior justices may get the less interesting cases, at least I to that know particular justice. I know where there's justice. a split in the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, the oldest of the minority justices assigns the decision and right. the Supreme Court would decide. Uh, so as the junior justice, judge. the joke at the U.S. Supreme Court is you get all the employee benefits and the tax cases, 
uh, as the junior justice. Whereas on our court, we get a mix <coughs> of oh, yeah. the tax cases and the first degree murders and the constitutional law and the insurance cases. We get to see everything in a way that I think other courts uh, don't have that system. Was there some gamesmanship a little bit, a strategy on the Supreme Court given that there was more subjectivity in the process than ours? Ours is pretty objective. I'm sure there is. I mean, there's certainly a, it, it, the, the fact that the Chief Justice or the senior most justice of the majority gets to the assign the opinions does lead to some gamesmanship because you want to retain, because the ability to assign the opinion can be par powerful, and so you want to retain that ability to assign the opinion. None of that's at play with us because they're already sort of pre-assigned by the commissioner's office. And so it eliminates any, and I'm not saying there was gamesmanship uh, that occurred, but but it's certainly a system that is not random like ours, is more prone to gamesmanship. Well, that's good to know because on what I'm working on writing, <laughs> uh, gamesmanship is involved. Well, in, in I mean, the we novel. recently had this play, Courting Harry, and one of the criticisms that came up and said, why well, Chief Justice Berger was maybe not as popular as could be, they said he would sometimes pass early on. Mm -hmm so that he would then come back and see where the majority is and try to be in the majority so he could control the writing of it. Right, and Justice Blackman actually wrote about that in his notes about, uh, about how much it bothered him. This is free. Anyone can go to the Library of Congress and read Justice Blackman's notes, and he notes the fact that it bothered him that the, the Chief Justice Berger would pass just to retain the ability to, uh, to assign the opinion. Big difference from the Court of Appeals to this court in terms of assigning and writing? Well, uh, much of it is the same. We also, at the Court of Appeals, received our cases assigned randomly. And in that instance, the Court of Appeals sits typically four weeks of the month. And uh, at this point, um, the um, assignment, e each panel has six, six cases uh, per week, and then uh, a judge is assigned uh, to be the presumptive author in two of those cases. We certainly all prepare on all six of those cases and are ready to have a rigorous uh, conference where we talk about how the cases should be decided at the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals judges do. I say we because I was one for so long. Um, and then um, once the votes are determined at that point, um, the, if the presumptive author is in the majority, then that presumptive author will write. Now, the cases at the Court of Appeals are provided, you ha have the opportunity to appeal as a matter of right. So we don't select the cases that we hear at the Court of Appeals in the same way that the petitions for review uh, process works at the Supreme Court. So every uh, one in the state of Minnesota who has a case has the right to appeal to the Court of Appeals and so the volume of cases that would be heard by the Court of Appeals is much greater and then as a result the number of judges is much greater. There are 19 judges on the Minnesota Court of Appeals. And I've seen a couple of cases recently where uh, if they were not unanimous decisions they were almost unanimous but several justices wrote a concurring opinion agreeing in principle with the primary holding, but differing in some respects from other aspects of the case. Yeah, and you know, one of my colleagues uh, said to me early on, don't write just because you want to write, write because you're going to have some sort of impact on the law or you're going to affect the majority decision in some way. Um, and I think that's the purpose of a concurrence. It's to say, it's to set a signal perhaps to the trial court, to the court of appeals, or to the legislature um, about a potential issue uh, that's sitting out there. So at least m my criteria for writing separately is, is I'm not doing it for ego. I'm doing it because there's some purpose I have in mind uh, for the separate writing. And many times during the course of our circulation of an opinion, um, comments are gathered from the justices. And many times those comments are incorporated in the majority decision. So a uh, justice, even after our conference where we decide the case and assign, and the case is assigned to a particular chambers, um, that justice is still getting feedback during the course of th the writing and really during the course of the circulation before the release of the decision. And that is an other, another opportunity for um, the assistance of my colleagues to <laughs> in the course of uh, the writing process to just refine the work and to make sure that it's clear, it's on point, it's concise, it's not wandering into another doctrine of law. 
Well, <coughs> you soon will no longer be the junior justice, as uh, David Lillehog will take the oath and join the court. Um, but I would be remiss if I didn't say how much I have learned during these 14 years. Uh, I guess it's 12 years that you're on the show, uh, Justice Anderson, and uh, some of the great discussions we've had, how much I have learned from you. I can only assume, and I'm going to ask your colleagues to comment on your influence on them in the few minutes that we have left. I'm going to fill up the next three minutes with an answer so that my colleagues won't be able to comment on me. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's the great it's thing about a hard drive is we can just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> you can just keep keep going. Uh, I, what I will say, I mean, it's been a, it's been a great run, and I'm very comfortable where I'm at now. Uh, but you heard me talk about it. Is that we've been very blessed in Minnesota to get good judges on our Supreme Court, even though we have different points of view, very conscientious, caring people about uh, you know understanding that we are really guardians of the law and so our court's going to be fine you know is nobody's indispensable and uh, I, I look forward to see how you folks develop and uh, you know the intellectual engagement that you have and that 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 you have with uh, my successor David Lillehog. Well, let me say it's, uh, it is an absolute privilege every day to walk inside the court building and to have these two folks as my colleague. I mean, they just add so much uh, to, the, to the way I look at the cases, to the way I do my job. And it's especially been a privilege to, to, to spend three years with Justice Anderson. Um, one of the things I've really enjoyed about him um, is I think it's more than a job to him. I mean, it, he, and it's more, to, more than a job to all of us, but particularly for him, he's, he's got a passion for the law and a passion for Minnesota. And so what I've really enjoyed is walking into his office and you know we have a hard case and we've conferenced the case and just talking about the law, talking about history or the mm -hmm. law and, and how this case may impact some future case we have. Just the, just the willingness to, to take time out of his busy <coughs> schedule to engage, engage me in, in some of those interesting issues. Yeah, and that's can I been say part of it. Let, let me get Judge Ryan. No, I'm going to say, I would guess that people would be surprised how much fun we have each other. Yes. So we, we really do interact. I mean, even when we're talking about tough issues, we do it in a way that makes it fun. Mm -hmm. We joke with each other. And I share Justice Strauss's views um, about uh, Justice Paul Anderson's uh, impact on the court, the level of collegiality, the total engagement in the law, and his love of the institution, the Minnesota Supreme Court. He is a wonderful steward. We have not even talked about his work with the Minnesota Supreme Court Historical Society, with the uh, restoration of the Capitol, that, and in particular the work that's being done to ensure that the Capitol Supreme Court room is maintained in its beauty and glory and as well as being made to be used in a modern era. But I think his greatest gift to Minnesotans, in addition to the work that he does on the bench, is the joy that he takes in his outreach, in speaking to others in the community, in making sure that Minnesotans understand that we serve them that the court is their court, and giving them a real understanding of how we work. One of my first interactions with Justice Paul Anderson was when I was a baby trial judge, and we were at a program for youth. And um, we were, sp it was a huge program. Students had been bussed in from all over, and we were on a panel um, talking about the court system and the various levels of court. We had fun, I, just, didn't we? I just want to thank you all so much. This this program has been so unique, and I wish that law students had the opportunity to sit and watch how fast this hour went by, and it has gone by. And uh, as I say, the unique opportunity is really appreciated by me, and I think by all our viewers. Thanks so much. It's thank a pleasure. You. Thank you. It Alan. is really a pleasure.